Um, so Patsy, great. Well, everyone's set. Patsy, you're good. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, well, welcome everybody. Um, we're really pleased to have you all here for this really special discussion that uh, Patsy Craig is going to lead. My name is Beth Waldman, and I've been the lead exhibition, uh, lead for the exhibitions and programming team for SF Artists Alumni, um, the group of SFAI al alumni who started um, this nonprofit in order to provide opportunities and support and create legacy for alumni of the San Francisco Art Institute based in San Francisco. So, so glad to have so many of you here. Um, this discussion is surrounding an exhibit curated by Patsy Craig uh, at the Midway Gallery in San Francisco that opened on June 16th. And we had a fabulous opening. A number of the artists were there and we missed all of you who couldn't be there, but um, the exhibits up um, for another week until uh, July 16th. And if you're local, I definitely encourage you to go see the works in person. But um, today is really, uh, I'm an alum of the San Francisco Art Institute from 2005. And so, um, you know, this is a, a, a really moving week for us with changes for our institution, um, the San Francisco Art Institute, but um, really glad that we can still gather and provide um, really the foundational discussions and depth into critical issues that um, we always did as artists or study to do as artists at SFAI. So thank you everyone for your artwork and for participating and um, special guests who um, are here to lend a, a further um, a level to the discussion um, with their own experiences. So I'm going to just quickly um, throughout the discussion introduce each speaker um, as every artist will be presenting their work and ideas and guests um, as well. So uh, before further ado, I'm very honored and, and grateful to Patsy Craig for uh, curating the show and organizing this discussion. And I um, wanted to uh, give you a little background on her formally. Um, Patsy is a curator and producer, an author, and an artist, and an Indigenous rights advocate. She has a background in fine arts and cultural studies, having received a BFA from the Rhode Island School of Design, RISD, in the USA, and an MRES from uh, Burbeck College, the University of London in the UK. For more than 15 years, she has been cultivating cross-cultural collaborations throughout Europe, India, the US, and Peru in the fields of art, music, architecture, urbanism, and environmentalism. This has included publications, exhibitions, concerts, conferences, and workshops, amongst many other activities. She has received grants for her work from the Arts Council England in the UK, uh, Cultural France um, Institute, to Francais and BNP Paribas, sorry for my uh, bad accent in French, um, the Goth Institute in Germany, Graham Foundation and Mid-Atlantic Arts Foundation, the Ministry of Culture and the United States Embassy um, of Peru. So five years ago, Patsy focused her attention on environmental issues and indigeneity. Her experience in 2016 with Indigenous-led environmental movement at Standing Rock, North Dakota, inspired her to learn more about Native American culture. And in 2017, with the support of the Goth Institute, she researched in this regard. In 2018, she collaborated with University College London to develop a project called Flourishing Diversity, and provide, this provided platforms for indigenous voices. Um, Flourishing Diversity was launched in June of 2019 at Gallery 46 in London with the Invisible Forest, an exhibition Patsy curated to make visible issues of environmental justice through the work of a renowned indigenous Peruvian Amazonian artists. In 2019, in October of 2019, the Invisible Forest exhibition was presented in the San Francisco Bay Area 
and also at in the US at Bioneers Conference and at the Dharma College in Berkeley. In January of 2020, Patsy founded the Awa Galleria in Cusco, Peru with the opening exhibition, The Sacred Forest, currently on, which was at the Dharma College in, in Berkeley. Um, now the gallery There's presents- There's people on this. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, now her gallery in Cusco presents contemporary and traditional art focusing on indigenity, environment, ancestral knowledge, and decolonialization, providing access to credi tradi cultural traditions that recognize, enrich, and perpetrate health biodiversity as the means to ensure mutual flourishing. Currently, Patsy is researching multiple aspects of Peruvian culture and developing various projects that amplify indigenous worldviews, drawing awareness to environmental issues in this regard. And as you can see, she was the perfect curator to bring upon for this project. And um, Patsy, I will let you take it from here. And many thanks once again. Right, okay, thanks, uh, Beth. So thank you everyone for being here today. Um, you know, we are here to learn a few things, hopefully. Um, we're going to learn about select artists' works. Uh, we're gonna learn a bit about the state of affairs in Madre de Dios, which is the area region of Peru where Eto Chime, the art collective that is um, involved in this exhibition is from. And we're going to learn a little bit about uh, the Northern California's history with the, with the gold rush, the impact uh, socially and environmentally. Um, and as the title infers, we're going to explore the issues that uh, are sort of surrounding our responsibilities, our roles uh, with all the environmental issues that we are sort of up against in these times. What is the role of art in the face of all the environmental challenges that we're confronting in these times? This is pretty much the question. Uh, just don't touch your microphone. We can't hear oh. you. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Um, what is the role of art in the face of all the environmental challenges that we are confronting in these times? That is pretty much the question asked here with this exhibit. Um, so the earth system is in crisis and a large and large numbers of people who have done nothing to cause this crisis are most exposed to its consequences. This is a fact. Many come from cultural traditions that enrich and perpetuate healthy biodiversity as the means to ensure mutual flourishing. These indigenous wisdom traditions are widely recognized for their sustainable worldviews and sophisticated understanding of our interdependence within the earth system. A little background. Well, Beth has sort of given you the background of, of, of who I am. Um, maybe too much information, <laughs> that's fine. Uh, so my cultural project called Awa is uh, a word in Quechua. Uh, Quechua is the language spoken, the indigenous language spoken by 14 million Peruvians in Peru. And the word Awa refers to weaving and the notion of interweaving. Uh, so that is what I do. I interweave visual culture in order to amplify indigenous worldviews because to me, it's clear that we have much to learn from this ancestral wisdom. This learning is long overdue and desperately needed at this point in our human story. A story that is currently driving us towards ecological collapse due to our ethically untenable relationship with nature. With this exhibition, I hope to inspire a reconsideration of all that drives us. So before Beth asked me to curate this exhibit last September, I was just beginning to think about working with the Echichime Collective. For some time, I had been wanting to produce an exhibition that dealt with the impact of illegal gold mining in Madre de Dios, but was not really familiar with Amazonian artists in the region. Then a friend suggested I join a live Facebook event featuring this Harakut art collective called Echochime. So I did. 
my initial impression was one, that Jessica Patiacha was amazingly well-spoken, and two, that I was excited at the notion of a collective because it mirrors more accurately indigenous philosophies. I had been seeking a model through artistic and cultural contexts in which to provide platforms to share indigenous worldviews, and I quickly realized the potential for this collective to speak with more relevance to issues of environmental and social justice, as opposed to the obsession with, cult, with the cult of celebrity and the arts that we all too often see in Western art contexts. I was immediately intrigued, uh, so fast forward, last November, Luis Fernandez was presenting in a few minutes, facilitated a meeting in Puerto Maldonado with the Etichima group and the rest is history. When Beth asked me to curate an exhibition through an open call with San Francisco Art Institute alumni, I proposed mine, What is Ours in Wake of Extraction because I felt that it had relevance to both Northern California and the Madre de Dios region both areas having suffered the social and environmental consequences of gold mining. So um, I'm gonna try and share these pictures with you. Here we go. Oh, it worked, great. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. So I, um, I took a trip to Puerto Ma well, I've taken various trips to Puerto Maldonado. And one of the trips I took was with Jessica Patiachi, who is the leader of Etochime, who we're lucky to have with us here today. Um, that's her in the image you can see. Uh, we went to the community where all of the members of this collective are from, where they live. This is a picture of Jessica. Um, picking some leaves and she proceeded to show me how uh, they were um, used to create dyes, uh, natural plant dyes. And those are the dyes that were, um, that are used to paint the body. And, um, you know, some of the, I suppose all of you have probably seen the images in the exhibition um, the way I structured the presentation of the Etochime works is that I centered all the works around these um, paintings that were of what are called lines, the lines of their culture. And these lines in the context of the exhibition are lines that are traditionally painted on the body with this, um, this particular um, uh, dye and others, but this is an example of the dye that um, is used in painting the body. So um, here's images of Jessica and her mom collecting the, um, the leaves that are crushed to produce the dye. And, um, and the idea with these, um, with wearing, uh, behind wearing this uh, painted designs on the body is to communicate with more effectively uh, in a more profound way with the spirits and uh, of the jungle. Um, so that was a, a really wonderful experience. It was very sad to see um, the environment surrounding where they live uh, and given this beautiful history um, this is, so, okay, this is driving into um, the community where they live. This is, this, what we're looking at in, under normal circumstances would be a very lush, typical Amazonian um, landscape. And this is 20 years of mining impact on the landscape just to give you an idea of what's going on there environmentally. This is what we see. Uh, what we don't see is of course the impact on these communities, um, you know, uh, culturally. They're losing their cultural identity 
and it's um, it's unfortunate. I think you know the what we have in the in the Madre de Dios is the impact of um, illegal gold mining, but of course all mining has its uh, detrimental impact culturally and environmentally. The illegal aspect of this mining is one that governments can um, sort of get their heads around and and sort of rally against. But um, but uh, but you know of course it's it's all mining that really has a detrimental impact. Um, these are images of uh, houses in her community, and um, just to give you, you know, unfortunately, I don't really have many photos of people <laughs> other than Jessica and her mother, but this gives you an idea of um, the environment where Jessica grew up. Huh? Um, Yeah. So um, there's some aerial views. This is how we could we we um, arrive at the locations, and these are parts of the jungles that you can see that are are not experiencing the impact. So just to compare the landscape, right? These are aerial views of. Um, of the environmental impact, all those sort of patchy bits and the ground here is, um, you know, the, the detrimental impact of mining in the region. And this is what artisanal mining looks like. It's uh, the way in which the mine, the, the gold is extracted and Luis is gonna fill you in a little bit more on aspects of this. Um, so yeah, that's uh, I think it. I uh, I am giving you a little background on what's on the ground there, and I want to um, introduce now uh, Jessica Patiachi, who uh, is the leader of the Atochime Collective. Uh, she's an incredibly determined and really intelligent woman, young woman who. In fact, was chosen to represent all indigenous Amazonians and address Pope Francis when he visited Peru in 2018, warning that the Amazon's indigenous people have never been so threatened in their territories as they are now, demanding an end to the relentless exploitation of the region's timber, gas, and gold. Uh, please join me in welcoming Jessica Patiachi. And Jessica, please unmute yourself if you can click the unmute button. I'm going to. Um, there you go. Thank you. I'm going to. She's going to say a few phrases, and I'm going to translate for everyone if she speaks. Oh, now, Jessica. Buenas tardes a todos. Buenas tardes a todas. Buenas tardes, Patsy. ¿Cómo están todos los presentes? Good. Uh, good afternoon. It's afternoon there to everyone. How is everyone? Soy Jessica Patsy Tayori. Soy del pueblo Arambu, de la región Madre de Dios, Perú. Her name is Jessica Patiachi Tayori. She's from the uh, region Madre de Dios in uh, southern Peru in Amazon. She she has played an important part in um, establishing Etochime, an art collective with uh, the Haraku peoples uh, that has been establishing itself for the past few years. Antes de Etochime, uh, desde niña, y yo he recibido bastante información por parte de mis abuelos, los distintos relatos que contaban la historia de mi pueblo a través de cuentos, mitos, Fábulas y cuando íbamos a pasear por el río que ustedes acaban de ver cuando era cristalino, se podía ver es como una avenida grande donde los abuelos se iban narrando esto sucedió esto pasó. So uh, ever since she was very young, she grew up in this community, um, playing in the rivers, and uh, it was the same rivers that you saw in the pictures um, where she learned her traditions from the elders in her community. 
eh, con el tiempo empecé a estudiar acá en la, la ciudad, que fue un poco difícil arraigarme de, de mi comunidad, y empecé a estudiar para ser profesora. Ahí es para hacer mi tesis, hago lo que es relatos orales arácnidos, que luego se convierte en una publicación, y sería la primera publicación hecha por una mujer indígena y también en la lengua. So she um, has produced a book called Los um, uh, Testimonies of uh, the Harakut, and uh, it's the first book that is written by a Harakut woman, an indigenous woman, an Amazonian indigenous woman. And she uh, left her community uh, to do higher education, and she teaches. Um, she teaches, um, I think it's like, Los Estudiantes Tuyos, Jessica tiene como 15 años, no? 14, algo así. Yeah, so she teaches 14, 15 year olds, um, and uh, yeah, that's what she does. Y luego, este, cuando se publica, este, quise que en mi libro se mostrara lo que era la pintura hecha por jóvenes arácnidos, porque desde muy pequeñitos pues tenemos el arte en las venas, desde los abuelos nos contaban que siempre nosotros en mi pueblo se hacían las pinturas corporales y como que queda ya internalizado en nosotros y quise que mi libro se plasmara eso, es por eso que dos estudiantes eh, jóvenes Arambut ayudaron a plasmar los distintos relatos de mi pueblo en ese libro lo ayudaron a pintar so in her book, she, um, uh, there's a lot of illustrations, which is pretty much where the Etochime uh, collective sort of came out of. They um, contributed to the book and her idea has always been for them to understand their um, cultural traditions and to use the, um, the context of painting to present uh, their traditions and ultimately their sort of worldviews. Estaba a punto de sacar lo que sería Relatos Orales 2, y pero me costaba mucho que los estudiantes no conocían mucho la cultura. Me di cuenta que todo lo que venían viendo la galería y todo eso habían hecho que los jóvenes se olvidaran. Y como yo les orientaba y dije, ahora lo voy a hacer yo, si yo conozco la cultura, Yo puedo hacer eso. Y una amiga vio todo eso y hicimos la primera exposición de arte donde yo la inicié que se llamó Soy Mujer Arajbo, donde rescata el papel fundamental que cumple la mujer en los distintos mitos y en, los, en las distintas costumbres del pueblo Arajbo. So, one thing she realized in beginning to work with uh, the, the youth in her community uh, and and those who form part of the collective uh, was that they didn't know enough about their own cultural traditions, that the um, influence of mining on their community had, uh, had really um, impacted in ways that meant they were losing an understanding of what their own traditions were. And so when she, was working on the book, it was, it was her intention to, um, to make sure they learned more about their traditions in, in, through the collective. Eh, después, no tuvo mucha relevancia, puesto que en mi región eh, prima mucho la actividad minera y todo eso, no les interesaba mucho saber de la cultura, no tuvo mucha relevancia y Pero el 2018 vino el Papa Francisco, fui la encargada de dar el discurso acerca de eh, los atropellos que veníamos recibiendo a causa de los distintos eh, actividades extractivas y ahí es donde le manifiesto al Papa Francisco aprovechando que tenía todas las cámaras del mundo a sus ojos. So, um... Understanding that her own community was um, losing its traditions, she took advantage of the visit of the Pope uh, in 2018 to uh, make him and the whole world aware of what was going on in their uh, community. 
the impact of extraction on their environment as well as their, their cultural. De las reflexiones de esa visita, hay una cosa que dijo el Papa Francisco, que nosotros teníamos que ser protagonistas para contar nuestras historias, que otros ya habían hablado con nosotros. Nos reunimos un buen grupo eh, para ver cómo la iglesia nos acompañaba en este proceso para poder este, reivindicar nuestra cultura y también ser conscientes que poco a poco las empresas extractivas o las actividades extractivas como la minería asfixiaba y estaba matando nuestra cultura, por ejemplo, la minería. So, um, one of the things she um, appreciated and learned from the, the Pope's um, sort of discourse uh, during his visit was that they had to be their own protagonists, that they had to tell their own stories, that it was no longer about letting others speak for them. Ahí nace Tochime, con los miembros de la pastoral indígena, pero dijimos al obispo, no queremos este, hacer la pastoral estructurada desde Roma, como dice, sino eh, que la iglesia sea nuestra amiga para reforzar, revivir, revalorar, y mostrar al mundo la problemática que veníamos viviendo los pueblos indígenas en este entonces hasta la actualidad. So, um, that is how Etochime was born. Uh, it, um, the idea was to slightly transform the relationship with the church, that the church was in this instance um, an ally and it was about um, allowing them the um, the spiritual and uh, political space to speak their truths, to tell the world about um, what was going on in their communities. El colectivo nace con un solo objetivo, que era esta de... Bueno, cuando di el discurso ante el Papa, recibí después amenazas hacia mi persona y hacia mi pueblo, y la gente, los mineros no querían que yo diga muchas cosas. Entonces entendí que la protesta es buena, manifestar, pero ahí no terminaba todo, sino de qué otra forma se podría manifestar. Y ahí es donde surge a través del arte. So, um, when she addressed the Pope, um, it it soon became the case that people were threatening her life because um, there was, it was a very high profile event and all the miners or, or many of the miners that were involved in the degradation in the region um, saw her as a threat. Uh, but she realized that it was um, important nonetheless to, um, to let the world know. Nosotros teníamos toda la intención de querer pintar, pintar para no olvidar y para que no nos olviden como, eh, como cultura, pero no teníamos los medios ni los recursos, así que hemos tenido como aliadas a las hermanas dominicas de Rosario, quienes han buscado este, eh, financiamiento, donaciones, y con lo que hemos encontrado, hemos empezado a armar eh, todo, no, no sabíamos, cogimos, nos donaron maderas, pinceles y así empezamos porque a nosotros teníamos acá, queríamos lo que nos habían contado los abuelos y lo que estábamos viviendo sobre el impacto de la minería, queríamos plasmarlo ya. So, um, they had everything inside of them uh, that they needed to say and they um, identified their uh, sort of um, mission with the collective. Uh, the idea was to, to, to paint so as not to forget. Um, uh, they realized that was the way that they could perhaps most effectively um, present their culture and everything that was happening to them. Uh, the Hermanas del Rosario, Hermanas Dominicanas del Rosario, uh, is the sisterhood that um, has been incredible in supporting them, um, providing materials, providing a space to work, and providing all kinds of support, generally speaking, for them to um, 
to produce uh, the work through their collective. Con el tiempo, el grupo de Tochime entendió que si bien es cierto no nos hacían caso en Madre de Dios, podía tener repercusión en el mundo, puesto que una pintura, una obra artística, dice más de mil palabras y queríamos que viendo nuestra pintura reflexionen y vean pues que este pueblo está en peligro, tiene estas riquezas y también está en, en está a punto de desaparecer con todo lo que acarrea la minería informal. So they understood that, um, you know, a picture tells a thousand words, that they uh, could use this context, um, this format to um, explain to the world what was going on, that they were in danger uh, of disappearing as a culture. Lo, las características principales que tiene el grupo de Tochime es que lo conforman niños jóvenes y nosotros que somos ya casi adultos que conocemos la, la cultura, uh, digamos la primera exposición fue la temática conocer las líneas Aragón y cada uno hace su boceto y pasa un filtro por los más grandes y te dicen qué has querido transmitir acá o qué relato has querido Entonces, si está mal, le decimos que corrija y pasa un filtro y recién se puede exponer y mostrar las pinturas. So the process, they work, um, everyone in the collective is, differs in age. It's a, it's a range of ages pretty much from, let's say, 13 to, um, to maybe 40, something like that. Um, they... Uh, have a way of working where everybody presents a sort of basic idea, a drawing for a painting and everyone looks at it and uh, talks about it and sort of um, decides what is appropriate for the development of that image and the, um, the relevance it has to them culturally. So they, that's kind of the process with which they work. En el grupo de Tochime también todos somos, eh, hacemos voluntariado porque no queremos que desaparezca nuestra cultura, a nadie se le paga, entonces tenemos ese principio puesto que no queremos que eh, distorsione lo que es el colectivo. Queremos mantener esta esencia para poder este, hacer distintas exposiciones siempre y cuando las donaciones estén presente, damos de nuestro tiempo, nadie nos paga por eso, para hacer las distintas pinturas y cuando uno es joven y no conoce mucho la cultura o está perdiendo, nosotros les contamos los relatos, la historia y les decimos, ahora que me has entendido, ¿cómo lo interpretarías respetando la estructura que tiene el pueblo arabo? Um, ¿Cómo lo entenderías? Eso lo es la pregunta para los que ven la exhibición o para los mismos uh, del colectivo. Del colectivo para el que tiene dificultad en cuando a veces no conoce. Okay. Yeah. So everybody volunteers their time to produce the work. Um, it's um, that they feel is uh, so important to the continuation of their culture. Um, they, uh, as, as mentioned, they all discuss the work, they all decide what is uh, important to, to present. Cuando Patsy nos, nos, nos contacta, después de una exposición que hicimos, puesto la pandemia frenó esto, este, y había la posibilidad de mostrar, eh, no creímos que iba a ser tan fácil o tan rápido eh, en que otro por otro lado del mundo vean nuestro arte eh, nos pareció extraordinario al inicio fuimos un poquito incrédulos puesto creíamos que no era posible pero, este, cuando teníamos la temática este, de la minería y las consecuencias socioambientales que tendría sabíamos que era un punto álgido que queríamos tratar igual lo discutimos todos los bocetos se, se discutieron y cómo es que cada artista del proyecto de Tochime miraba a la minería o también 
mostrar la escultura de Ajmut que es lo que estaba en peligro, ¿no? En desaparecer, si es que sigue proliferándose en la región. So, Jessica is explaining that when I contacted them, uh, they didn't necessarily believe that uh, we could realize a project like this so quickly, uh, a context in which they could be presenting their, um, their culture, their worldviews to the outside world. Um, and so, uh, yeah. El proyecto Etochime, eh, ahora estamos contentos de que esté en Estados Unidos, me gustaría que esté en otros países más, puesto que todo lo referido a la contaminación del medio ambiente, a todas las actividades extractivas que afectan a la Amazonía, no solo recae en, eh, no solo afecta a los pueblos indígenas, no solo afecta al pueblo arácnido, sino también está en riesgo la humanidad. Um, she wants to make clear that, um, you know, everything that is going on in the Amazon, all the extractive industries that are impacting it so negatively are not just affecting her people, the Harapu, the and not just the indigenous communities in the Amazon, but all of humanity. Hay mucha gente que se pregunta, ¿no? No tengo nada que ver yo con la desaparición de un pueblo indígena o la Amazonía. No tiene nada que ver conmigo porque yo estoy al otro lado del mundo, estoy en Europa, estoy en Asia, pero sí tiene mucho que ver. Eh, solo reflexionemos, ¿no? Cuando tú tienes un anillo o un aro de oro, eh, ¿te has preguntado alguna vez cuánta gente tuvo que morir para que tú tengas esa alhaja ahí? ¿Alguna vez cuando tú estás probando Nutella o alguna galletita, sabes cuántas comunidades chipivas, entre otros, han tenido que ser este, desalojadas de sus propios eh, territorios para que se ha, las grandes transnacionales hagan cultivos grandes, monocultivos de aceite eh, de la palmera? Sí tiene mucho que ver. So, um... You know, some people across the world might ask themselves, well, what do I have to do? Why, why should I care about the Amazon? Why should I care about the impact on indigenous communities in the Amazon, the impact of the extractive industry? Um, and Jessica says, well, it's, it's, it has a lot to do with everyone. Uh, those of you who wear golden, rings or golden jewelry you can ask yourselves you know uh, how did how did what was the um, history of this object uh, how many people has it impacted um, for it to be something that I use in my um, life that's so removed from the Amazon um, how uh, Even with food, we are uh, now there is a, a sort of um, the agricultural trends are moving towards mono um, monocrops, and um, and this is um, also impacts what you eat. And so there are so many ways in which you across the world are impacted by what's going on in the Amazon. Cuando yo fui a Roma hace unos años, la gente me dijo que debería ser, debería sentirme la mujer más dichosa del mundo por estar en Roma, uno de los países más extraordinarios. Pero cuando vi Roma y le dije, yo no lo veo como lo ves tú. Ellos solamente veo cementerio de bosque. Y cuando este, me vio así, me imagino que los pueblos originarios habrán estado acá y encima de sus cadáveres han tenido que matar lo natural para poner cemento y eso tiene más validez que la vida de un pueblo indígena. Yo me imagino de acá 20, 50 años, no quiero que suceda eso con la Amazonía, que se supone que es el pulmón del mundo, que es el corazón de la humanidad. Y solo así, eh, si nos aferramos a que la selva se tiene que depredar para asfaltarlo con cemento, 
entenderemos que vamos a desaparecer como especie humana. Uh, Jessica went to Rome a few years ago. She was invited for uh, a conference there and many people said to her, you must feel so lucky to, to have visited such an amazing place. And she said, you know, what I, what I saw moreover was how, um, how the forest had been um, uh, paved, uh, that it was um, a manifestation of um, having destroyed um, a natural environment. Um, and I, she says she feels that um, she doesn't want that to happen to the Amazon. She doesn't want the Amazon to be paved over as it were um, to create culture because that would be the destruction of of civilization, I think a little bit like that. <laughs> sí, el grupo colectivo Etochime también este, una de las características que tiene justamente es plasmar eso eh, como eh, al denominado desarrollo que trae lo de afuera eh, destruye, no, no solamente nuestro territorio, nuestra cultura, también va destruyendo mentes. ¿Por qué? Porque te pone en la pared o, o el desarrollo o, <ríe> o, te, o te sometes o no, o te matamos, ¿no? Es un poco difícil porque hoy en día no puedes coger un bus o bote, un avión y nadie te recibe a cambio, por ejemplo, un, una roba de yuca o pierna de sajino. Todo hoy en día es el sistema monetario, pero se ha visto en todo este tiempo a la Amazonía como despensa que hay que explorar, explorar, pero no hay que reponer. Y el pensamiento de los pueblos indígenas no es así. El bosque es parte de nosotros. Y entonces, sin el bosque, nosotros vamos perdiendo como cultura, vamos perdiendo nuestra esencia. Y eso es lo que nosotros queremos manifestar también en nuestros cuadros. Okay, I'm going to recap that. Um, indigenous culture is um, about replenishing, not only about um, extracting or, or um, you know, using resources. So everything about their culture is to um, replenish what is taken, which is not true with the um, dominant culture. They try to uh, exemplify this in the in the works that they make through Etrochine. Um, Sabes que Jessica, creo que el tiempo hay que avanzar. So, en conclusión. Sí, bien. El grupo Etrochine, eh, bueno, quiere vivir como colectivo mucho tiempo, ¿no? Pero todo va a depender de de nuestro tiempo también, de las donaciones que, que haya. Es, no somos una institución, un colectivo con fines de lucro. Simplemente queremos mostrar eh, nuestra problemática, nuestros sueños, nuestra cultura que está en riesgo. Y gracias por, por escucharme y que también estén interesados ¿no? en nuestro arte. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you for being interested in um in our work, we hope to continue producing artworks through a Tachime for a long time. And if we have the proper support, we'll be able to do that. Um, so, gracias, Jessica. Uh, next, I'm gonna pass the mic over to Luis Fernandez. Uh, he's the executive director of an organization called Cincia, Centro de Innovación Científica Amazonica which means Center for Scientific Innovation in the Amazon. He's trained as a tropical ecologist. Luis is an expe expert on the environmental impacts of artisanal scale mining on tropical landscapes, particularly on the effects of mercury, contamination on wildlife, wildlife and indigenous communities. They research the impact of extraction in Madre de Dios, the same area that Etochime, our collective, are from. Thanks for being here, Luis. Uh, please unmute yourself, Luis. Uh, sorry about that. No worries. Hi, how are you doing? Uh, well, good morning, everyone. 
Thank you very much for being there. And, and thank you, Jessica, for such a powerful statement. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen and, uh, and provide a short presentation. Um, so just confirm with me that you can see my uh, screen. Mm -hmm. yep. Yes, thank you. Okay, great, I'm gonna just put it in presentation mode here, just a sec. Um, okay. All right, so right now, uh, so I'm gonna talk a bit about um, essentially the, uh, the past and the present. Currently we're in California right now, um, in, in the North Bay in San Francisco. I'm, I'm calling in from San Francisco. Uh, and San Francisco is uh, a modern city, but it has a history uh, that was born uh, of gold. Um, and that ties together with the work that I do and the reality that Jessica lives in, in uh, a place that is being transformed by uh, essentially um, a tale of two metals, gold uh, and mercury, and how that interacts with the environment and the people. So in California, um, there is a kind of a legend of gold mining, uh, how gold, uh, Miners came to this area and through hard work and scrappiness, uh, essentially built what has become one of the innovators of, uh, of a modern economy on the west coast of the United States. Um, and, and it's kind of a legend, uh, I would say more of a myth uh, in, in many cases. Um, because one part of the discussion is uh, that is not part of what we understand is the effect on the environment and of the people in which uh, we're, we're living in the area. And, and I'll focus on the environment part because we've heard many stories uh, already, much power, powerful narratives about people. But the environment, when this happened with uh, was transformed. And these are pictures of water cannons, essentially blasting out sediments to get to the, to the minerals underneath it. And, and these are basically river deposits where um, they started to liquefy hillsides to turn mountains into slurries that then get processed to sift out gold. And we're gonna, and I want you to take a look at these images. These are images, these are photographs that were taken in the 1860s and 1870s. And these are basically giant water cannons uh, just starting to transform the landscape and essentially allow people to sift through all this rock and mud and sand to get to little pieces of gold. And what had resulted was a devastated landscape. And because of the the passage of history, uh, much of what we understand of San Francisco is a legacy uh, of destroyed landscapes in the Sierra Nevadas. Uh, and uh, as we'll see, the legacy of all this work through, um, through Mercury. So I'm gonna take us from California to Madre de Dios. And Madre de Dios is in Peru and South America. And, and it's an area that is uh, on the triple border between Peru, Brazil, and Bolivia. So it's southernmost part of the Peruvian Amazon. And as I mentioned, this is my, uh, my comments here are gonna be a tale of two metals. This is gold, um, as it looks like when it comes out of, a, of the first process uh, in the mines. And this is mercury. And, and what I want you to remember is that without mercury, there is no gold. So they're always twinned. Um, and and this, this is a process that happens in a place that is, a, is not mountains in California, in North America, but essentially a riverland, uh, a vast uh, plain in the Amazon, right next to the Amazon, uh, next to the Andean mountains. And the images that you'll see are not of California. And, uh, but these are images uh, in current day. So these areas are, trans I mean, these are areas of forest that are being changed rapidly. And um, they look in many cases very similar to what we saw in California 150 years ago. This was a tropical rainforest. Uh, 
uh, a few years before this picture was taken. And then if you actually can see that these are, instead of uh, people with horse and cart, that these are bulldozers taking apart um, small hills and, and plains and transforming them essentially into something that looks more like the Grand Canyon or those blasted out hillsides in the Sierra Nevadas in the 1860s, um, where huge holes are opened up and people using equipment very similar um, to what we saw 150 years ago, using the same techniques that were used 150 years ago. Um, and this is what artisanal and small scale mining or ASGM as it's, as it's more commonly, uh, more uh, easily just said is. Uh, and this represents about 20% of the gold that's produced in the world. So we're not talking about a simple case that this is essentially a reality for over 80 countries in the world. Um, so the process also includes the use of mercury, mercury, this liquid metal that some of us, if we're old enough, remember we're in our thermometers and, and in the things that we use to take our blood pressure, but is used every day. It's a, an extremely toxic metal. It's one of the top five most toxic elements known to man. There are entire um, United Nations uh, international treaties to, the, to restricting its use and to the uh, eventual elimination of using this because of its toxicity to humans and to wildlife. Uh, and inside, in, in, the, in the palm of this miner's hand is an amalgam. An amalgam is a blend of mercury and gold. And essentially, this is the magic substance that allows a miner uh, with his two or three colleagues sift through tons of rocks, extract a tiny, the tiny amount of gold that's at the bottom of these rivers, sifting, uh, trying to separate one gram of gold through one ton of rock and sand and create this little package. It looks like, kind of like a dumpling, but really what this is is 50% gold and 50% mercury. Um, so, I'm having a little difficulty with my PowerPoint here. Here we go. Um, so uh, what this results in is a transformed landscape. Um, and these are the landscape uh, that I work in as a scientist. Uh, I'm a tropical ecologist and I am the director of a, of a team of scientists that are located in Madre de Dios to, to do a series of science uh, uh, studies to understand what is happening to these landscapes and, and very importantly, what can be done to bring them back. Um, so these are the colors that I see. We're switching now from the past through the present and, and I'm, I'm, I did not color this. This is what it looks like. These are mining camps on the shores of mining pits that were carved out of the rainforest. Um, about a year before this picture was taken, this was an unbroken plain of pristine rainforests. And after a year of having tens of thousands of wildcat miners invade this area, they carved out using those water cannons, these series of pools you can see these little blue tarp tents on the edges of these um, and, and essentially start to liquefy the landscape, destroying all the forests, killing all the animals and creating essentially this poisoned landscape of uh, which, is which is now the largest uh, anthropogenic wetland uh, in the southern Peruvian Amazon. Um, so the, the questions I ask or, uh, and that I try to address is, what is the cost of artisanal gold mining in the Amazon? Uh, and, and, and specifically the cost of forests, the cost of watersheds, the cost of biodiversity, and the cost to indigenous communities. Um, I'm sorry, I'm having a lag with my presentation here. So, uh, not sure why I'm a little stuck here. So I will see if I can move through some of these uh, slides, which may be maybe a little heavy um, for the system to process. But well, that so the organization that I that I am leading right now is uh, CINCIA, which is the Center for Amazonian Scientific Innovation or Centro de Innovación Científica Amazonica, and it's based in Puerto Maldonado, which is the capital of Madre de Dios. The, the Peruvian state where Jessica uh, and the Harakpu people uh, uh, live. And what we do is reforestation. We do mercury in the environment. 
uh, we use uh, artificial intelligence to create uh, policy intelligence and, and help education, both, uh, all the way from kindergarten up through college to, uh, to be able to uh, understand the environment, become scientists and contribute to the knowledge, both traditional and uh, indigenous and native knowledge to the study of what is happening and the changes that are occurring so quickly. Um, and I'm afraid that the images are not working. So I'm going to try to reset my presentation. And I see that I have a problem here. So, um, so I don't want to uh, bore you. I'm going to stop my presentation here because I think that um, the, the point is that what we're trying to do really is um, create the understanding through science of what the changes are. And essentially, and I wish I could have shown you, but the changes that we see are that mining creates deep scars uh, in, in tropical rainforests. And many things actually change forests. There's agriculture, there's, um, there is uh, also um, the, uh, uh, um, um, the uh, um, sorry, cattle ranching, and other ways uh, that change the forest. But those ways are not as permanent as mining. Mining occurs in, uh, uh, in areas where biodiversity is high, soils are very poor. And when you mine, you create a, uh, a loss of the potential for regrowth. So we're losing forests, we're having all the biodiversity destroyed and we're mining out the soils down to 30, 40 feet. So you destroy the, the potential for the mines to recover. Um, and we use uh, uh, satellite imagery and we have a drone network. Uh, we basically have a fleet of high, uh, high technology drones where we uh, have eyes in the sky to understand what is happening, how things are changing. We also have uh, a laboratory uh, that we've built in uh, Madre de Dios that analyzes mercury. And this is the first mercury uh, laboratory in Madre de Dios. And this allows us to detect mercury levels in uh, forests, uh, in wildlife, in people. And, and this is something that we uh, is of great value and interest, especially by indigenous communities. Um, mercury has a very unique capacity to concentrate in the fish, uh, in rivers that have been poisoned by mining using mercury. And so we need to know how indigenous communities are being affected. And we have worked over years uh, in uh, Madre de Dios to uh, with native federations, FENAMAD is a, uh, the Federation of Indigenous Communities in Madre de Dios, and with individual uh, communities to uh, offer hair testing for indigenous members, understand their level of contamination um, because they eat fish. I mean, these are, these are many cases are communities that are not living in or near cities. So they are traditional fishers they eat bushmeat. So understanding how they're affected is, uh, is important. Um, and we find that in many cases, these communities are highly affected with extremely high levels of mercury. Um, in some cases that uh, uh, may result in permanent uh, um, health effects, particularly in developmental, um, uh, de in, in the development of uh, their uh, neurological function, cognitive function. Um, we found one community that had levels that were 20 times the, the World Health Organization's accepted limits. Uh, and in general, we, we have found uh, by uh, testing more than 24 communities that indigenous people are uh, more than three times uh, more affected with levels that are three times those of non-native communities. Um, so uh, this is all important information not just for awareness by people from the outside um, and by the by uh, health authorities and, and the government with the hope and expectation that something will be done. Uh, we, we work with health uh, ministries and with the environment ministry, 
but also uh, with the communities themselves, because in many cases, they are the last people to know what's going on. So what we, we have been working with several communities, uh, particularly the Majigingas, and we hope to work with the Harakut and other uh, uh, communities because there are several ethnicities, there are several communities in Madre de Dios um, for uh, understanding how they may be affected, producing information in their languages. This is one of the reasons why I'm, I'm so very pleased to be working with, uh, with Patsy and uh, the community and the and ethnogene, the 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 community of um, of artists to be able to get the word out in different ways. I'm a scientist. Uh, I I collect data and I show these data in a particular way um, that that I am able to. But what I do recognize and, and I think is critical is for scientists and artists to work together to also express um, what is happening in different ways. I think that it's important um, to uh, contribute the knowledge, both to the knowledge holders, the, the local uh, communities in Madre de Dios about what is happening, um, learn from them about how they are experiencing it, um, sharing the information that scientists like myself and my colleagues have discovered and, and, and take the responsibility of providing that information in a way that can be best understood and best used by them in, in the way that they want to express uh, their uh, concern to, to the people that they decide and also work within collectives outside the country to be able to try to move the needle, to raise the awareness uh, and, and, and understand. So I think by, by combining efforts uh, between scientists and artists, I think it's, uh, it's more powerful. And, and the hope is to empower these communities to, to help determine their future. Um, so we'll be, we'll be, con uh, we'll be uh, continuing this work. Um, and uh, we hope very much that this, uh, this exhibition contributes to, the, to that knowledge. And, and of course, your awareness for what you uh, are experiencing when you come see the exhibit. And, and hear the, the discussions by people like Jessica and, and others. Um, I apologize for the, uh, today was not a good tech day for everyone, I think, uh, but I hope that some of the images that I've shown I, I give you a flavor about what, what the, these communities are really experiencing it and, and, and actually tying back to us as Californians, or at least that those that, that live in California and the transformation that those indigenous communities also suffered which has not been documented. I mean, uh, when I was doing a bit of research for my comments today, there are no narratives by indigenous people of how they experience those changes. I mean, even today, we cannot eat the fish from the San Francisco Bay and from many of the lakes in the Sierra Nevadas because of mercury. Um, the traditional fishers uh, of uh, the Ohone and other communities in San Francisco are still feeling that legacy I mean, those stories have not been told. Uh, and if they do, they have not been amplified to the point where it is available for us to kind of easily access them. Um, so uh, we hope to, that, or at least I personally hope that the stories of those communities in the Amazon and other areas also allow us to reflect back to the injustices of the loss of the voices that uh, communities such as the ones in California, the Yukon, uh, Alaska, other places that are in North America, in our backyards, uh, in addition to those that are occurring in modern day in over 80 countries, uh, are, uh, are not being expressed. These voices also need to be heard, and I'm glad to uh, help uh, facilitate that as, as, we, as I can as a scientist. Thank you, Patsy, and thank you, everyone, for, for, my, for having me. Thank you so much, Luis. Yeah, this uh, uh, such an amazing wealth of information and um, heavy hearted so. And uh, I think any opportunities for artists to work with uh, scientists was amazing. So um, I hope we'll all stay in touch about those possibilities. Uh, Patsy, um, do you want it to um, speak to Michael Nafi's work? Oh, too? okay. Hang on one sec. Um, so he sent me a, um, 
a, a just a statement he wanted that I asked I asked him if he could produce a statement that I could read so that's what we're I'm going to present right now. Totally forgot about that. <laughs> okay. So Michael Nafi is a SFAI alum and part of our exhibition. Mm -hmm. um, so unfortunately, he couldn't be here. Yeah. But um, so here's what he says. He says so. He, his work uh, for those of you that have seen the images of the exhibition, which I think most of you have, are the photographs um, presented in a grid of uh, mining uh, taking place in in Minas Gerais in Brazil, which is where he lives. So uh, he says, I can't say I know specifically what is happening in the Marias region of the Peruvian Amazon, but as I have been spending a significant amount of time over the last few years in the state of Minas Gerais, Brazil, where the world's largest iron ore mining company, Vale, is located, I have a pretty good idea of the description, destruction being wrought on that environment. California was mined heavily in the late 19th century, with, which left an indelible mark on the state. At that time, the technology used to mine was quaint by today's standards. The California gold rush provoked the great move westward in the country, which also led to the genocide and accelerated dislocation of indigenous peoples, as well as great environmental damage that came directly from the mining itself. It is a history I was taught as a child growing up in California, yet what it really meant seemed very distant to me. In the state of Minas Gerais, there was a similar process in the 17th century with the initial gold rush that displaced the original inhabitants of the land. That initial gold rush had a great social impact, not only on the indigenous communities from the land, but introduced intensive slavery to the mining of gold. This legacy of exploitation of the peoples as well as the land is still at play today in how people are treated as well as the environment. The modern iteration of the mining process utilizes the most modern techniques and machinery to recap the maximum amount of mineral from the earth, to reap the maximum amount of mineral from the earth. Toxic refuse left behind in trailings, dams, which are in close proximity to many communities are ecological time bombs as they have been poorly built and are prone to bursting with devastating results. The effect of mining on the indigenous communities in Minas Gerais has caused these people's dislocation from their lands and further alienated them from the quote unquote progress of the mining economy. They are seen as impediments to the expansion of the mining companies who control so much of the politics of the state. As an artist, my work concentrates in the actual process of extraction and its aftermath. There is incredible beauty in the landscape that is fruit of hypertoxicity that is a great poisoning of the earth. I find the forms and abstractions that are a result of these earth changing processes fascinating, all the more so because I know they're the fruit of man's venal quest for profits. I'm aware that I too am a consumer of the raw materials that are the inputs for today's consumer economy, which is a part of modern life. I can clearly see with my own eyes how the riches flow away from the communities and into others, leaving immense open scars that will be permanent blemishes to what has taken place. Art would seem to be a frivolous concern when there are so many people afflicted with the toxic effects and living with environmental damage and alienation. Yet it might be the only thing that remains to document what has been done and why it seems to be a worthy enterprise, the stupefying beauty and fantastic shapes as well as the improbable colors capture the eye and lead one to question the processes and the incentives that led to the decision to devastate biomes and put at risk entire communities. Who makes those decisions? Who benefits? How to mitigate the dangers? It is my hope that those questions will arise from looking at the art made around extraction and hopefully be answered by those who have the means to make a difference in the future. Thank you, Patsy. And um, Michael is an MFA alum from SFAI. Um, he's currently living in Connecticut. His work was the, the grid of nine beautiful um, uh, photographs um, in the gallery space. So um, sorry he couldn't be here in person, but um, yeah, that was a really well-written statement pulling together a lot of what's been discussed today already. Um, well, we're lucky enough to have a, a few other SFAI alums. And uh, Patsy, if it's okay, I'll do a little introduction. Okay. 
Um, Liz Miller Kovacs is here today and she'll be speaking about her work next. Um, Liz has participated in, in several of the SFAA um, exhibitions and is based in Berlin. She's an interdisciplinary artist and filmmaker uh, with a studio practice rooted in queer punk, post-feminism and activist performance. Her work focuses on the cult of commodity in globalized society and its effect on our relationship to the environment. She explores the central paradox of the current era, despite the rhetoric of technological advancement, humanity seems more preoccupied with assimilating, with assimilating to mediated images than preventing looming environmental disaster. She's exhibited her works and performed in major art centers and galleries around North America, Europe, Asia, and Australia. And um, at SFAI, she was a MFA in new genres and also completed a visual arts PhD at Sydney College of the Arts in Australia. So welcome, Liz, and I'll let you take it from here. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's really exciting um, that there are so many artists um, from and other researchers and activists um, from other places in the world that can join us today. So, um, and I'm hearing more and more about this network, and there's more exhibitions starting in Berlin that I'm now becoming aware of, so that's great. Um, I wanted to take some time and show you some images um, and just talk a little bit about the extraction industries. Now, I, you know, I hadn't considered much the California gold mining because it's such an you know, ancient history, but when I, you know, got the emails and I started looking into this project, I realized, you know, there are, of course, you know, there's the toxicity of the water, the displacement of um, indigenous communities, which, and generally poor communities in general, which are always almost always displaced um, when industries of extraction move in. Um, but also the fact the this that silt, and this is like another aspect of, you know, a lot of the extraction images that I produce, people say, oh, this is, you know, a marble mine. Why is that so bad? You know, and it's like when you start to look into what I I I do a, a broad, I, I research broad scopes of extraction, some of which are salt mines, which don't seem to have as much impact, but of course there is always some and tend to, they do tend to create new kind of biospheres. But even, you know, what are seemingly the most kind of benign industries of extraction actually have severe environmental implications and as well as often displacing, you know, members of the community. Um, so, you know, it's like the silt that runs off from these mines that can actually completely impede agriculture and basically kills everything in the waterways. So that's something that I just wanted to add. Um, Luisa's um, presentation and Michael's statement were pretty complete, but that, that's something that I noticed, you know, where, when people are like, oh, this is really pretty, you know, it's like, yes, but it's just, I, I was listening to um, Jessica's presentation, so, you know, when she said, you know, everyone just consider where these things come from, you know, and use, you know, don't think about just how much you can have, but really give more thought to the palm oil that's in your Nutella or, you know, the gold that's around your neck. So I wanted to start with that. And I wanted to share my screen with you and pull up one of the images in the show that comes from California. Um, which is Owen's Venus. So this is um, a huge lake that was drained by industries of extraction. It's uh, near Bishop, California. And I was really struck by this particular lake, um, number one, because it was one of the first places I'd seen where the water changed color due to extraction industries. Um, in this case, it was actually from a bacteria that is salt loving. But when I researched more about this particular lake, um, the reason why it's it was dry completely and it created an environmental disaster in California that was like created horrible toxic dust that basically covered, you know, 
lar a large portion of California, and it was even affecting down into the Los Angeles basin, creating more pollution there. So there, they around 20 years ago, this is this has been this lake has been there for around 40 years. But around 20 years ago, they started a water mitigation project, and that's why it's now wet. Um, which has helped somewhat, but it's not enough. Um, and what, so- What is the name of the lake again? It's called Owens Lake. Owens, okay. Yeah, yeah. Aren't familiar with it is I actually, unlike Jessica and her culture and a lot of indigenous communities, I actually go to these places and I, try to be as safe as I can. And I'm there for a very short time um, because I want to experience it. And I try to take as many precautions as I can. Um, and the thought of people actually living, you know, in these situations, there are people that actually live on the bank of Owens Lake. Some of them work for the Borax factory and there is a Rio Tinto mine there also. Um, but so the toxic dust that's here, um, and it basically was creating, you know, huge, huge smog problems. So it's it's still there. It's not as bad as it was, but it's a giant lake. It takes at least two hours to drive around it. Just so you know, that's there in California. It's today, you know, it's it is the sort of mining boom of today. It's still going on. Um, there are multiple mines there. And so this sort of struck me because it referenced California and it's kind of an update on sort of what happened um, in not, not so much for gold because this is, it's a different, I have not, since I generally trespass on most of the mining sites, I have not made it to a gold mine yet, but I'm very open to it. If I had the opportunity, I'll go. <laughs> uh, Cause I want to see these things firsthand and, and I want to record my experience in my sort of shrink wrapped membrane um, and sort of draw the parallel between the history of Venus figures and effigies of and the sort of cultural worship for the feminine. And, you know, the idea that, I mean, Jessica said that, you know, the Amazon is the heart of humanity and the lungs of the world. Well, it's also, you know, the world is considered mother earth and the fact that it's kind of considered this sort of thing just to take and use rather than something that should be, you know, center. Um, you know, that how we treat it should be, there should be like, you know, scientific research every time anything is taken for, but for our, you know, survival as a species, if nothing else. So um, that's why I, I, I want to record my, that's why I don't paint these um, images. I don't take aerial photos, even though they're beautiful. I actually go there and experience them and I record that and it has to be photography and, um, and I try to be as safe as I can, but sometimes I feel sick afterwards. I'm not going to lie. Um, I'm going to share another piece with you that reminded me a little bit of Jessica's. Jessica, I'm sorry. Sorry. Um, I don't know why it's not sharing. See if it will work. Uh, we can see it. It's a blue uh, person on a yellow lake. Yeah, interesting. Okay, you can see that. I can't, for some reason, it's not showing up online. Um, it's still showing Owens. But anyways, this is, here we go. Um, this is Jamana Lake, and I probably slaughtered the Romanian. Um, I went, which I visited with Stephanie Loveday, who was on the panel. Um, this is a mine in Romania. Um, it's, it's the runoff of a mine in Romania that is full of cyanide, which makes it orange. Um, the mine is in the mountain above. It flooded this village down below, um, which had been a village that had been, uh, been there, a agricultural village for centuries in Romania. And basically the mine um, gave the residents a little bit of money and promised them a better life if they left, which, they negated on basically it was a lie. Um, so a lot of people left. A lot of people, some people stayed, and they are living on this lake, which is rising every year. There's about 25 residents, um, and they are still engaging in a certain amount of agriculture, just on the periphery of this lake. Um, you can see where the. I don't have a, a photo of it handy. You can see where the the steeple is sticking up from the lake. Um, in the center. 
And even as we walked around the lake and you're, it's the ground is mushy and you're stepping in cyanide, there's no way you're not absorbing some of, you know, the cyanide in the lake. So um, this was really striking the fact that there's so many, you know, that I, this was my experience of witnessing a place that's firsthand people being displaced, displaced and basically just poisoning the environment. So, and, and basically lies in complete disregard for humanity from a mining company. So I wanted to share that with you. Um, but yeah, I was working my way around the globe and the longer I research, the more I learn about the different ways in which mining affects the environment and the different kinds of mine and how they affect the environment. And from what I, in my research, I've I found, I mean, literally hundreds of um, cultures that are being displaced as well. So I think it's really important that this be known. All right, I think that's any questions, anyone? Or well, thank you, Liz. I think for um, the because of timing, we might just um, allow people to put questions into the chat, but. Um, yeah, it's um, amazing to see this this piece from Romania and also so fun that you and, and Stephanie have been working together in your individual practices, but partnering up to access these landscapes together. So um, really strong work, you know, I love it. <laughs> and um, Stephanie uh, Love Day is here and she's gonna share her work next. It'll be interesting to see what sort of crossovers there are. Uh, just a few words about Stephanie. Hi, Stephanie. Um, Stephanie Loveday is a Swiss uh, Canadian visual and media artist, and her work also combines uh, photography and video, but also sound to interpret the human altered landscape. She explores conjunctions between simulated and real environments in her work, combining fictional geological artifacts with natural and constructed terrains. So these new territories in her work question our perception of landscape and point at sociological, environmental, and political conflicts. Um, and she uh, has she lives in in Germany as well and um, obtained her Bachelor of Media Arts from Emily Carr University in Vancouver, Canada, and her Master's of Fine Arts from SFAI. So thank you for being here and thank you for contributing your work. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me on the panel discussion. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen. Um, can everyone see that? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so this is the project that I have in the uh, exhibition. Um, in the physical exhibition. Um, and so um, first I'm gonna say a little bit about my practice and then I'll go into the project. So um, my, my current practice, um, I mean, even then it was like this too, but for this project, uh, the one that's in the exhibition, I just work with photography, but uh, my current practice is based on site-specific inspiration situations, recording imprints through multiple media formats, so sound, uh, video, and photography. Um, spatial and corporal ways of producing knowledge are crucial in my practice and respond to the immediacy of the environment, as well as to visible and invisible ecological and socio-political impacts on the ter territory I explore, including local production and land use. Um, and my work embraces natural and industrial places and landscapes, uh, discarded material, waste and leftovers, and considers how the digital and analog interact in specific ecological and social contexts. So basically in my practice, I walk around a lot and make recordings um, within uh, specific locations that I've researched. Um, so this project is in the Colombian Amazon called Temporary Waters. And um, so this is located in Leticia. And I was there on an artist residency uh, through the, the National University in Colombia. 
and I worked a bit with an anthropologist at the university, uh, Juan Echevarri, and then um, worked with his students. And um, through them, I got to know the indigenous community and they invited me um, and, and the students to, um, to some ceremonies. And um, yeah, uh, but <laughs> so this region was uh, like, heavily impacted uh, Letitia in, during the rubber wars. So it wasn't, it doesn't have any gold mining there, but that you can still see the impact of the rubber wars based on the, um, uh, the dislocation of indigenous population. Um, there's still some communities that are based in the forest, but um, a lot of people were kind of encouraged or I don't know if they're forced, but definitely encouraged to move closer to the river. And um, at that area, it gets flooded every year. So it also creates a lot of um, like living kind of uh, precariously. Um, so this, uh, this image was in the exhibition. So when I was there, the river was, uh, flooded the most it had ever been. Um, so many houses were up on stilts and even then people had to like live on the roof of their house because the rest of it was underwater. And so this is a, a flood, flooded pool or like a, a pond on the side of the road. Um, yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, so I, I'm not sure what else to say about this one? So some of these ones are from like the indigenous communities. Um, this is there and here, this is there too. And the um, community was a Takuna or Takano um, Indian. Um, and uh, yeah, so this project um, explores the shifting and soluble concepts of land and territory in Letitia and the surrounding Amazon. Um, and in this work, I was moving through impermanent pathways and flooded waters and examining how uh, borders and resource conflicts have impacted indigenous communities and shifted the movements of people in an area defined by dense jungle and shifting riverbanks. And Leticia is located at the edge of Colombia, directly on the border with Brazil and Peru. Um, and as I said, it was heavily conflicted um, over resources during the rubber wars and is still now even a um, very militarized zone. Um, yeah, so. Thank you for sharing uh, yeah, these <laughs> incredible photographs. I mean, the, such strong compositions and just really feeling the gravitas of the situation. <laughs> there, you know, this is, uh, you know, contemporary artists really bringing in, you know, the sort of layered approach towards looking at um, the longer term effects, the trickle effects of economy and industry that um, result in go being able to go in there. Like there are some comments going in the chat, which is terrific. Um, would love to continue this conversation with Luis because we can see um, how bringing artists to those actual spaces can help to elevate the, the, the situation that, that's going on today, right? And, um, so thank you so much, Stephanie. And um, in light of time, I'm just going to move us forward. Um, we, we have Paul uh, Glaviano. Did I pronounce you got it correctly? Right. I hope. <laughs> oh, good. Um, and Paul is, um, he was at our opening, which is terrific. He's been active in um, fine art and culinary arts and education for the past 30 years. He actually um, studied undergraduate and, and graduate, um, did his graduate work at SFAI, so uh, experienced it all, it's awesome. Um, he is a founding art teacher at the Academy of Thought and Industry in San Francisco, and has been a professor at the Art um, Institutes of California and San Francisco in both the art and culinary departments. He actually began his post high school education at West Valley Junior College in Saratoga and it was there that he began a serious art making practice, which continues with him today. He studied with uh, uh, Julius um, Hatzkafi, Sam Tach 
I mean, Julia Satovsky, Sam Chikalian. Yeah, Bruce McGaw and Carlos Vila at the San Francisco Art Institute. So welcome, and I'll let you take it from here. Thank you very much. And I know, uh, I think what I'll do is I'll share my screen, and I'm just going to kind of move fast through pretty large bodies of work. Uh, essentially, I'm an uh, environmental landscape artist, traditional oil paint on canvas. And I think just by looking at them, you'll get the gist of what I'm about. See here. Where is it? Hang on one second. So can you see the my screen? Oh, here we go. Yes, we can. Thank you. Here. Okay, so um while I'm not necessarily associated my artwork with mining in particular, I mean, the idea of extraction and when I saw the call, it seemed to make a lot of sense to me about what my art's about. So um, starting with all of the California fires, I've got a whole series of fire paintings, a few of which are in the show right now. Um, you know, basically, you know, we have an all year round fire season now, it doesn't stop. And so what i am seeing going on globally is, uh, you know, the extreme weather patterns and how it's all intertwined, it's all connected. And so ultimately I'm trying to, through creating beautiful images, bring some kind of awareness to what's going on so, uh, you know, currently right now, I guess the sequoias in Yosemite are the great, the great old trees are, I heard that they believe they have able to stop it and protect them, but really volatile right now. And in my opinion, it's probably just going to be getting worse each year. So it's probably only a matter of time. Uh, so these are images. Uh, some of them, the burning house images are from uh, outside of Santa Rosa, the entire community that burned down. Uh, firewalls, you know, these fast moving fires up the hills. So one of the, uh, this is one of the paintings that's in the show, Blaze. Mm -hmm. Basically, you know, people barely escaping with their lives or in some cases not even being able to because of extreme weather. And then a whole nother series of of ash paintings, I call them. These are sort of like the neighborhoods, the aftermath after these fires come ripping through and devastate their neighborhoods. So they tend to be a little bit more on the abstract side, but ultimately I'm kind of really just looking at tons of images, actual images, and then painting the these ideas. I'm not, you know, I'm not painting from photographs so much as that I'm painting from collective research, devastated neighborhoods. You know, this used to be a neighborhood and all that's left of it is a grid of where homes used to be in ash. Devastated neighborhoods, cul-de-sacs. You know, this used to be a suburban neighborhood. And then that kind of leads into also the hurricanes, you know, the hurricane season that has been getting longer and longer and more and more devastating. So there's a whole series of, of hurricanes. There were quite a few years there, in fact, when, when these images were made, where there were so many, one after another hurricanes, just devastating the Gulf region. So that's what, you know, Hurricane Harvey, Maria, uh, Irma, you know, there's just like one after another. So that's when this series developed. And then moved me to, in 2017, was really concerned. I revisited uh, Glacier Bay, Alaska, the glaciers that I had visited 30 years before and decided when I came home that I needed to do a series about the retreating glaciers, which is also another global phenomenon that's happening. It's probably we're gonna see quite a few of them disappear in our lifetimes. So this series of works is, and once again, that kind of related to you know the extraction or the, the diminishing 
landscape. So it made sense to apply to the show and really glad that I met Patsy and a group of like-minded environmental artists. So these uh, are some of those images. A lot of them are from the actual Glacier Bay, but this one in particular on, on the right, I wanted to show the four. Um, this is Mendenhall Glacier at 100 year, the, the, the four small panels, it's very small painting, 100 year time lapse every 25 years. So 125 years ago, the glacier looked like that. 25 years later, it had receded that far here up until where today, where it's actually receded into the valley I think some 37 miles now. And well, <laughs> I made this a few years ago, so uh, I would have to go back and look and see where it's at now. But it it literally is is going to disappear. And I saw this painting 30 years. I mean, this uh, this glacier 30 years ago I was able to get up quite close to it. And so then to go back and see the difference. I mean, at a point where you could not get close to it anymore, you could only get with. 25 miles away from it to actually even see it. So there are the uh, glacier, the glaciers retreating. And in that show, I had culminating uh, a video of one of the greatest calving uh, films ever caught on film, which was essentially uh, just the most enormous chunk uh, of ice coming off of the, the main uh glacial plate and actually since then this was 2017 there's been even larger ones that have happened now so you know it's real they're they're disappearing and it's happening now well it's significant how you've been able to return to these same places over and over again um which is um your media paint you know allows you to then express that consistently in a way that you know really hits your heart um, yeah, that's. Uh... Yeah, I absolutely, you know, I think paint is the perfect medium painting. Uh, in, also, I've kind of always just been connected to the landscape and I'm a landscape painter. So I feel like this is important work that needs to be made. Um, and it cultivating, you know, large 18 foot panel, Glacier wow. Bay, Alaska, six panel. And my idea when making this was, uh, you know, if they were to be in the show, I was offering to sell each panel individually. And so as somebody would buy one, the, the glacier would be shrinking. So that was kind of my culmination. And from the tiny little four panel time lapse to the, to the large scale, this is actually has a good home, uh, EDG design firm in uh, Novato. Anybody's interested in going to see it, it's got a great place to be seen. So yeah, these are, that's the, that's the, the glacier painting. Um, and then I'm just going to keep it moving quick. Tsunamis and earthquakes, you know, we have tsunamis back going back to 2004, the whole series of tsunami paintings. Once again, that extreme weather happening in earthquakes, which kind of inspired me. I think it was 2004, the Pakistan earthquake that was so devastating. And so, you know, there's no shortage of these, landscapes and these ideas to paint and so it's, it's just kind of ongoing for me at this point um earthquake that's actually was uh inspired from the uh uh the pakistan quake well highlighting yeah other sites like also brings you know brings it into global territory which is important which is uh fantastic to see that you've traveled so far and been able to share you know so many different um forms of devastation you know i just wanted to um to also say i don't know if you can hear me can you hear me yes yeah. um that you know when i went to visit paul's studio i was just blown away because he's been uh doc like documenting natural disasters due to climate change for how many years, Paul? It's like 30 years. Well, yeah, it's 30 years, yeah. Which is just extraordinary. I mean, I think it's um, that mere fact, and apart from the fact that they're very beautiful objects of art, but it's just a really extraordinary thing. So, felicitaciones. <laughs> Thank you. So, I, yeah, I kind of wrap it up there. I originally, my original work 
going way back, I was painting landscape, abstract landscapes from my time spent in the landscape. And so they're not so much about the devastation of the climate, but that was, you know, going back 40 years ago. So then all of a sudden it shifted to, oh, I started really making clear series of works, the fires, the glaciers, the hurricanes, because I saw it all as one thing. And I thought series of works was the way to best express them. So, thank you all. Thank you so much, Paul. Yeah, um, that's, oops, am I frozen? Oh, thank you so much, Paul. So um, yeah, just the way we can make these messages accessible in many forms is, is through our art and, you know, painting even more so for a, a larger um, group of people. So um, thanks for sharing all of those. I wish we had more time, but I'm going to just push this forward. And um, Super Marin uh, is going to um, share her work with us next, and I'll, I'll give a brief introduction while you get set up. Uh, Super Marin is an Indian artist working at the intersections of sculpture, landscape, and architecture. Through a research-led speculative and site-specific practice, she creates installations and environments that seek to reconsider the values of that spaces offer and the ways through which they mediate human relationships. Um, she is currently an assistant professor of art at the University of Cincinnati and holds an MFA degree from the San Francisco Art Institute and an undergraduate degree in exhibition design from the National Institute of Design in India. And um, I'll let her take it from here. So thank you so much, Supermarine. Thanks so much, Beth, and thank you all for um, being here, for making this whole thing possible. It was just so informative to hear about everybody's practices and all of the shared research and interests. I'm going to try to keep it short because I know Zoom can be tedious and taxing after some time. Um, and I'm just going to dive right in. Can you see my screen? Yes, thank you. Fantastic. Um, so, um, oh, is it? okay, thank you. So field is um, the title of the project that I'm going to be sharing with you uh, today. And it's a collective project uh, with Jess, who's a performance artist, also an alum from SFAI, myself, um, Jill, who is a designer who sort of is super interested in bio design and, and material innovation and Zenia, who's an architect. We're all from different countries, different parts of the world, and we have sort of met nebulously in this strange network through this project. And the project really started when I was invited to Oakland um, through an invitation by Natalia Mount to spend the summer on a residency accessing the city's archives. So the image that you see before you here is the Frank Ogawa Plaza in Oakland. And that right there is the Oakland City Hall, and that's the giant lawn in front of the space. And over the course of the summer, I um, was able to really get access to all the conversations between the city and the architects that were responsible for the redesign of that public space. So the, the space, the landscape of the space has changed several times over the years. This is just a few instances of how that plaza was designed. You can see in certain moments, it was full of flowers, it was full of trees, it was an orchard at some point. Um, and in the early 90s, uh, sort of all the existing trees were removed except for this last standing oak. Um, and I was able to access the brief documents that the city planners and architects had put together for the design competition that would be the design of this new public plaza. And um, so that's an image of the cover of the document that I'm talking about. And that's sort of 
the format through which that brief was created. And so it's uh, my own backgrounds in architecture. And so for me, these kinds of documents and communications are like extremely informative. And sometimes I think that the brief is the design. It is the framework through which design is offered or um, sort of formalized. And of course, the design of this public space is extremely modernist, very much a sort of place making schema. Some of the language that they're using is like, how do we, what's like the appropriate aesthetic for the front yard of City Hall? How do we keep undesirables away from the space? How do we keep the formality of the space, remove all the existing trees and sort of in a way, how does this landscape remains subservient to this extremely imperial architecture of City Hall. And you can see some of the images of the actual City Hall building, which was the first um, civic skyscraper in the United States. And um, it was like, this is sort of the moment when the, the project was born for me because I was interested in that sort of abject grass lawn. And I was interested in thinking how would this sort of giant uncomfortable panoptic space, how would this landscape that's been colonized, that's been dominated, that, that's only meant to serve its architecture, um, how would it respond to the space? And in a way to me, the, the, the grass field became this idiom for, um, sort of shared space in, 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 in civic plazas, right? Uh, the, the homogenization of bodies, the homogenization of ecologies, the homogenization uh, of experience. And so in our first proposal to the city, we just asked if they would be willing to pause the mowing of the public lawn for one season. That was the entirety of the proposal. And I was interested in seeing what kind of timid forms of diversity would try to emerge once the plaza remain unmowed for a season. Um, I likened the mowing of the lawn to the repeated acts of erasure that are conducted on American soil, on American land, erasures of histories, erasures of identities. Um, and I was interested what would happen just by that pause how could we slow down the industrialized processes of mowing, of maintenance, of beautification, of the aesthetics of sort of state control that I enacted in public space. As the project continued, I was really surprised that um, they accepted my proposal. There were a lot of weird questions about like, what will people think? Is it gonna sort of, uh, is it, are they gonna think the city's broke? Um, there's such an investment in like manicured lawns in our public spaces and we've inherited all of those colonial ways of thinking. Um, the, the, the aesthetics of it to me are just as important as the physicality of it. And so at the end of the season, when we were going to mow the lawn, I was sort of, I was really sad because I, had, I, I sort of had come to love the, the grass clippings as these tragic, they, the grass will never be a tree, right? The grass is this invasive, rhizomatic, um, sort of immigrant body like my own. Um, and how would it be precious in any way in this public soil, in this public land, in this homogenized space? And um, that's where I started trying to create a new material from grass clippings. So the idea, the prompt to the city was that once the clippings would be mowed, once the lawn would be mowed, could I use that material to symbolically create some kind of artworks and sculptures that would then dissolve back into the land. So I'm interested in like questions on public art, on, tempor on sort of time and temporality, but also in a more embrace of, of decay um, and an observation of, of sort of our own mortality in that process. Um, alongside the sculptures, we had proposed a series of durational performances that would simply be observing the growing of the lawn. Um, we were interested in 
rethinking the legacies of women's work on land. Um, I'm from India. I sort of have a lot of memories and recollections of my grandmother's farm and all of us as like kids playing on the farm and working the field and all the women on the field. Um, and I was interested in thinking about what that means in contemporary times after colonization, after modernity after this, this entire project of urbanization has been executed. So I find it really interesting to think about that history of the gold rush that has led to these contemporary spaces that are now flattened and erased and sort of covered up, right? The, the grass is like a good cover to all the atrocities that may lay beneath the soil. Um, so that's a little bit of the process through which we went to. We spent about a year, I partnered with Jill, who was who was a stranger at that time in the midst of the pandemic, um, and we cooked every weekend trying to develop a new bioplastic from lawn grass clippings. And we were fortunate to succeed in those endeavors and sort of presented a lot of our research at various venues across um, across the country. Um, I'm interested in like cows and, and, and we talked, touched a tiny bit upon like the, the impact of cattle rearing in, um, in climate change and their relationship with the grasses. So I'm sort of seeing this, um, I'm seeing the grass as this sort of symbol of the Anthropocene in some ways, this artificial nature, this uh, conquered um, nature? Is it natural? Is it all genetically modified? Um, and I'm currently working on various scales and kinds of sculptures that are derived from this material. So I cook the material in my kitchen, in my house, with my hands. It's a very intensive process. It's sometimes a grotesque process. It smells, it smells of compost. It takes time and it takes a, a different kind of attention to work with this kind of organic material. I've had to learn in this past year a lot about not just how to make the material, but also now how to fabricate with it. And through the course of the process, the, the grass itself has become a collaborator in my work. Um, I feel like she speaks back to me. She doesn't let me just do what I want. She makes me keep my own desires for control in check. She makes me change who I am and what I do and what I believe in, in terms of like my own aesthetics um, to, to work with her. So I'm, I'm thinking about this material, not just as a material that I can conquer, but, that, but as a material that starts to transform me and transform my own relationships and friendships within the world. Um, well, that's, um, I just do have to um, wrap, uh, ask you to wrap this up quickly, but I do want to say what an amazing connection you're having with this um, layer of nature that's been introduced to our constructed landscapes and how, how far you're taking this um, and with such reverence. And so, you know, at different generations and different relationships to uh, nature, you know, the Anthropocene and all it presents, um, it's just such a, a great entry point because that is often what many uh, call nature is, is grass. You know, uh, a lot of people really don't get beyond that. Um, and so uh, if you wanna make a few more comments, we just, um, and sadly have to move Yes, on. absolutely. Thank this you. is just about the end. Uh -huh. And so this is how I'm sort of scaling up um, the sizes and the details and the ways of working with the material. Um, and I'm also sharing um, a lot with the public through sort of open, open source workshops where we cook and make artworks together. Um, there is sort of the research of how these are gonna decay, which is an active component of the practice and how they return back to the land. Um, but thank you so much for your um, infant sort of for being here. And um, there's a, another sort of performative aspect to these works as the body engages with them 
which is something that's still in development. Yeah, this is uh, your work simply amazing. Um, just the way you're creating your own media out of out of nature, out of grass, and all of those different relationships. So, um, if you have any links you want to put in the the chat, you know, to share. Um, I'm so sorry to shorten your time, but um, thank you so much for sharing your work today and an exhibit. Um, it's such a complex you, process. Thanks. Did you did you do you know Chris Marin? from SFAI, he was in photography, but I'll, I'll send you his link. He's very, um, uh, he really works to invent, uh, construct um, a lot of materials in a very scientific way, the way you have, you might enjoy checking his work out too. Um, great, and um, Pam Axelson, thank you so much for your patience, um, Pamela, I'm sorry. Um, and uh, I did just wanna do a brief introduction. I, I did download a couple of your images so I can um, share that screen. Uh, Pamela is a graduate from SFAI in 1972. Her childhood years were in rural towns in Southwestern Idaho, Northern Montana and Northwestern Nebraska, as well as the Rocky Mountains of Colorado and the still semi-rural northern end of the San Fernando Valley of Los Angeles. As a child, she lived close to the earth, learning to love rivers, lakes, streams, mountains, forests, and tidal movements of the ocean and bays, um, as well as rocks and desert rock formations of the West. These became the basic elements of her work as an artist, which have been at the center of her life from her first mountain building experiments as a child. Her, earth is very much, her art is very much about earth, its history and its elements uh, in a non-representational and abstract way, um, focusing on memory. So Pamela, I'm gonna um, bring up some of your images and I hope I present them in the correct order. But um, thank you for being here. So I will share my screen. Oops. Uh, oh, here, this one. Um, tell me what you can see. I have a few of your images here. Um, uh, yeah, it's. Do you want to start with maybe? Not, I don't think right now, anyway, I'm going to talk about specific images because I want to go okay. back a bit and. Uh, just talk about some of the early things that happened that, that sort of formed my relationship with the work. But I also want to just say that this, this overall, this presentation has been amazing. And I think one of the things that so comes through in all the work and its diversity is how much people really care about the earth and where it's going and the people and the other inhabitants of this planet, including uh, plants. And I, I just want to go backward to my first experience of, of making a sculpture was uh, actually at UC Northridge in the San Fernando Valley. And I had been, you know, somewhat of an advocate for not taking out orchards and the various green aspects of the Northern San Fernando Valley in those days, which are completely gone now. But, um, but I, so I was in my work, I started digging. I started making sculptures that were holes in the ground. And that process of, of, of trying to understand something when I'm at any, any new stage in my own work, always involves digging. So early on when I was at the Art Institute, I, I started collecting uh, various earths from around the Bay Area. Uh, I had a red wagon and I'd go up and down Market Street and get to my studio with whatever earth I had managed to, uh, to gather on the weekend. And I made um, hanging forms on the side of my studio on what was then Pier 3. Uh, by layering different earths into these bags mixed up with various um, things, plant material and sometimes skin casings. So my, my studio was pretty smelly at that point, but, um, and that went on to the development of, a, of an earth press that I made to, to make these layered forms in, 
in bags so they would have a bit more form. And they actually ultimately looked a little bit like cow pies. And I think you can see one on, on, my, uh, on my website. And so that was the, the beginnings were there at the Art Institute where I, I came to the Art Institute thinking, oh yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be an oil painter. And I was for days, months, I was coated in oil paint and finally I, I couldn't take it anymore. And so I started using mud on campus and uh, that carried me into the other ways that I was using mud. And my, my travels in, in life have included uh, a trip to, to Peru and Puerto Maldonado and the Madre de Dios area. I just wanna mention this because uh, I was so struck by the photographs, Patsy's, and uh, also what Luis was talking about. I, I'm, I'm so struck by what has happened to this beautiful river, you know, confluence of rivers village on the frontier area of Peru at that border area. And when I was there in 2004, visiting my son who was working in a, uh, teaching English and everything else, I think in a small rainforest village called Inferno, uh, the riverbanks were intact. They weren't you know, eroded away as what we could see in, in those photographs. And uh, as a travel nurse, which is something that I did here with the Department of Public Health, I, I became aware through my reading of uh, what was going on with the mining. And, I, and my understanding is that this mining is completely illegal what's going on in the Madre de Dios area. And so I have some questions about that. Um, I think in California, what, what was done to the Sierras was there, was, there were no laws, it was kind of lawless, but I don't know. I think somebody who knows the history better could, could tell me, tell us that. But anyway, so the Madre de Dios experience was, was a very deep one and the experience of looking at all the visuals in this, in this discussion today is without doubt going to be incorporated into my work and my concern about what we may, what we are in fact losing or what we are in fact uh, hmm, with great awareness destroying on a day-to-day -day basis. And that, that that does, it, it's, a, it's a huge concern and, and uh, I'm not sure how we're going to solve it. But what I, my work is, is not a direct, it doesn't directly discuss this. It takes the elements of, of earth and, and rock and density and the biologic world and puts them into forms that, that are reminders of what, what life can give us in our exchange with the natural world. And it's, they're all done. After I stopped using oil paint, I never went back and I did watercolors for a long time. And these drawings are all uh, uh, ink and ink wash and uh, done with materials that I, I feel good about using at this point. And it's always a discussion when I'm, I'm my, in the work that I do. So I did a lot of metal work, forged metal work for many years. And now I question, you know, how much of that should I do given the environmental aspects of that. And so I use clay more and I feel more, much more comfortable with that. And I, I, uh, I did uh, quite a bit of copper forging for some years. And now, you know, there's a question also about whether I should continue using a metal which you know historically historically is a, is is a, a sacred metal you know for women and um and women were you know in the early days of forging uh of using metal uh in african countries this is you know in prehistory the early days of it um the met metal the, the days of, of preparing the metal excluded women completely. 
And that's one of the reasons that I became interested in steel and forging and copper. But so these, these drawings are done without, without they, st they start without an intention of saying with a, with a, with a verbal uh, idea, they start with motions into this world of, of this blank piece of paper where I can begin to discuss some of the things that have been carried in me throughout my life that many, many, many of which have to do with, with the earth, with growing up close to the earth, with playing in the fields and farm towns, with, with the growth of crops around me. And in, in Montana, I, I lived in Butte, Montana, which was in, when I lived there in the 50s was a huge copper mine. Um, Butte, Montana was called the armpit of the nation because it was really dominated by this huge, you know, excavated, layered down into the earth, a sort of spiral, spiral ro roads that went down um, to, to find the mine. And subsequently in, you know, probably 20 years or so after I left Butte, Montana, they closed the mine and the mine is now a lake. But, but it again raises the questions that uh, I think Luis was bringing up, well, many people brought up, which have to do with how, how, we, how we try to make things that are useful to people in various ways, like a lot of um, metals that are being extracted are going into airplanes and various types of technology that we all take advantage of and by by flying and and driving cars and things like that but um uh, anyway so the i don't know what the situation is with the pollution of that of the lake and so these are the things that go into my drawings i'm I'm mostly these days, I think, focusing, my focus seems to be on land and water forms and uh, potentially the way the tides change in the bay is coming into the drawings too. So I think I've said enough. I hope that was somewhat coherent. Um, and uh, uh, thanks, thanks everybody for being part of this. It really is a beautiful show and, and um, nice to be with you all. Thank you, Pamela. Thank you, Pam. I, do you mind if I just make some closing remarks, Pam? Oh, please, yes. Yeah, I just want to uh, thank everybody. Everybody's work is so beautiful. The show is really extraordinary. Um, and it's been a real pleasure to work with you all and get to know you, which I've, I've, I've done. I've, I've um, had sort of independent interaction with all of you and it's really exciting to think about what we can do in the future and of course what we've done here with this so thank you again to everyone well thank you patsy and yeah this has um been such a pleasure i really think each of the artists in the show online and and at the gallery have been pivotal in our thinking and pamela your own experience of mining you know locally in your backyard as well as being in areas like Madre de Dios like and having seen those changes and then witnessing them again today I mean that those sort of perspectives are so key I think in connecting the dots so um, the more we can you know share and um, give light to the situation the better so I look forward to talking about any other opportunities that may follow. And there are a lot of interesting discussions even about you know, the role of um, addressing these sort of themes, the, the toxicity of our process as artists, et cetera. So that could be a, a good Monday discussion. Um, so, so many layers here, but um, thank you to everyone who's participated. Um, Patsy for all your work, Luis for all your insight, Jessica is no here, I mean, not here any, right now, but. What a pleasure that she could join us and, and share her perspective um, and her experience. We um, hopefully will get more of those experiences down on paper or through art 
And um, thank you to all the, the guests, the audience who has stuck with us during a very lengthy but well worthwhile Zoom. So, um, so I hope everyone um, will leave with connections and um, we'll look forward to this last week of the show. It's available for viewing in the afternoons at the Midway. So share the um, you share that with your with your friends and community. And Maria, president of SFAA, thanks for sticking with us from uh, all the way from Europe. <laughs> Hope it's not too late there. So thanks so much, everyone.